Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Losses Above Replacement, the greatest baseball podcast, two great years. I'm today's host, Matthias Altman, Kurosaki, and with me, as always, we have our own Hall of Fame candidates, Alex Clark and Ryan Splashpots. Gentlemen, first things first, as we begin every show, how are we doing on this fine Monday evening? Uh, things are going great, actually, over here. I just spent the last week with my best friends, and so it has been an absolute blast. I just got back home today, in fact, so I'm happy to finally be back on the mic, though, but um, a good week with great people is something that I will treasure forever. Uh, I witnessed the Baltimore Ravens clinch their first ever home AFC championship game Saturday afternoon, but that was just, that was just magical. The first half, you had us in the first half, not going to lie, but the second half, Lamar was unbelievable. The defense was unbelievable. Actually, the whole game, just I'm so proud of everybody and got to beat Kansas City on Sunday. So, uh, obviously, uh, shortly after we recorded our last episode, my team was sent home from the NFL playoffs. Uh, They weren't going to last very long in there. Let's be real. Uh, But other than that, Last week was kind of up and down. I'll say that much. I uh, caught some type of sickness. I don't know what it was. It didn't last very long. And then I was dealing with some shoulder and back stuff. But I've recovered well, I think. Uh, I'm actually going to the Knicks and Nets game tomorrow at Barclays Center. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, My first NBA game in Brooklyn, that is. And obviously, I get to see my team play there. Uh, So we're doing all right. I actually saw my nephews over the weekend. Uh, We went to a science museum. That was awesome. Got to eat dinner in Jersey City. So anyways, uh, as I alluded to in the intro, Hall of Fame results are revealed tomorrow. We will find out who gets enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Which, by the way, if you have not been out there, especially if you're a baseball fan, please Mm -hmm. do go out there. It is, I feel like it's something you just have to do as a baseball fan and as a sports fan. It's an awesome place. Uh, I had been there a couple times. One time when I was really young, so I don't remember it. But the second time I went for Fourth of July about ten years ago, and that was it was a great time. But anyways, uh, as of right now, at least as of before this recording, two hundred ballots have been submitted exactly, and we have five players at or above the seventy five percent threshold. Adrian Beltre is sitting pretty with ninety nine percent of the vote. Joe Maurer eighty three and a half. Todd Helton eighty two percent. Billy Wagner seventy eight percent. Gary Sheffield, exactly 75%. Sheffield in his last year on the ballot, his 10th year. Wagner in his ninth year. So, guys, taking a look at the uh, the results so far, uh, what, just give me give me your general thoughts. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of how the voters have voted? I mean, so far right now with the, with the ones that you said are above that threshold, I have no problems with it. I, I, I think every single one of those, those people uh, deserves to be in the hall. I'm really happy to see Beltre getting the big love in his first in his first year. That is, again, I think that's fully deserved. How an amazing of a player he was, and also very happy to see guys again like Sheffield, who's it's his last year on the ballot, getting a lot more love. And I really hope he also makes it as well as uh, uh, Wag- uh Wagner. Like he's one that we've talked about on this podcast. I think every year that we've been doing it come this time say that he deserves to be in. He deserves to be in. He deserves to be in. I would love to see a big class go into the hall of fame this year. We've had a lot of really small classes as of late. I would love to just see like, what we just get a bunch of people to go in. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, generally we should be more accepting in the hall of fame um, because at the end of the day, there's going to be more than two players that get in from any given ballot, right? Even if the average hall of fame voter, for example, last year, the average hall of fame voter only voted for between five and six players. Um, There's going to end up being more than five or six hall of famers. uh, When we, you know, go 15, 20 years down the line, when you get veterans committee guys, uh, you get guys that make it on subsequent ballots, like an Andrew Jones, who's not going to make it this year, but should make it in the next couple of years. You're going to have Joe Maurer, who may or may not make it this year, but he'll make it at some point. Helton will make it at some point. Um, and then you have guys like A-Rod, Manny Ramirez, that you know may or may not make it at, at any point, really. So 
I think there's more than five or six deserving Hall of Famers on the ballot. I think they will eventually get in. And I think some writers get caught up in. I don't know. I don't really know what they get caught up in. It's just like vote for the Hall of Famers. And we can have a small hall, but you're still going to have multiple Hall of Famers at least on every ballot. Yeah, I'm going to say that, you know, you get every writer gets 10 votes, every voter, I mean, they get 10 votes. And to me, I don't think there should be a limit on how many players you should be able to vote for, which is why we see some writers leaving off some deserving candidates, in my opinion. They've even explained, like, they've had to squeeze the players off because, you know, you're only limited to 10 people. There are more guys on the ballot this year, uh, more deserving guys. And you know, then there's also, you know, you have to get at least 5% of the vote to stay on the ballot. So there are some guys who are going to vote for players just to try to keep them on the ballot, uh, which I mean, we're going to get into our personal ballots, but I do that with one of my players. Uh, but there's, I also think that, you know, if you have 10 votes, I don't see really a reason why not to use all 10 votes. I'm not saying you have to use all 10, but I strongly encourage it. And I understand if you, you know, have your beliefs that certain players you just don't want to vote for. I know in the past we've seen it with guys like Kurt Schilling, you know, mm-hmm. guys who, you know, they have character issues, I understand. So, you know, if if you leave them off, like, be my guest. But I feel like you should at least give that vote to someone else who deserves it. Uh, so I agree. Yeah, that and that's the thing is I, I understand uh, taking the character clause into consideration. I mean, that's why we, we have guys on here who have those type of issues. I mean... There's, and I feel like, you know, the, the the Hall of Fame has some, you know, a bit of a checkered past with honoring those type of characters. But uh, th- I still think, though, there every year there's at least 10 guys on the ballot that are deserving of at least getting a vote. So I'm not saying all 10, every guy you vote for is going to get in the Hall of Fame, but it's something worth considering. Uh, so, you know, I think we might as well get into our personal ballots so who wants to reveal their ballot first splash you seem eager so tell us your your guys well so this is a tough decision i had 11 guys that i have and i have to do the cardinal sin of strategic voting um I, and i'm going to leave off a guy that i believe is a hall of famer i believe should make it and it's gonna gonna stink that i might not have a chance to vote for him in one of these uh but but here's my my ballot in uh alphabetical order uh bobby abreu one carlos beltran two adrian beltre three todd helton four andrew jones five uh manny ramirez six alex rodriguez seven gary sheffield eight Chase Utley, nine, Billy Wagner, 10. Interesting okay. there. So Abreu, right. Beltran, Beltre, Helton, Jones, Ramirez, Rodriguez, Sheffield, Utley, Wagner. All right, okay. Al- Alex, who, who are your 10? All right, my 10 are as follows. Uh, we've got Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, Billy Wagner, Joe Maurer, Gary Sheffield, Chase Utley, Andrew Jones, David Wright, Bartolo Colon making it, and Bobby Abreu. I think that all of these guys are very well deserving. Uh, two of my personal favorites that I uh, love to watch play, Adrian Beltre, and again, big sexy Bartolo Colon. Like, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think, again, all 10 of these are going to make it, but like, I, I very much think that all of them have a great Hall of Fame resume to them as well um i there's still definitely a few like people like bartolo as well like does have his issues where he was caught with steroids at one point and i've been a very i've been very vocal about how i don't like stars as well but it was a one-time offense and it was uh one that he immediately like retract back on so you know i did his time all that kind of stuff but i think that all these guys have been great for what they do joe mauer for a good period of time was the best catcher in all of baseball adrian beltre is going to go down as probably one of the most exciting third basemen to watch todd helton and absolutely stead it's like a stalwart first baseman wagner one of the greatest lefty relievers we've ever seen 
Like these guys all have cases to them why they deserve to make it. Yeah, and uh, you know, a couple things. I mean, Joe Maurer is uh, it's only seven times as a catcher won a batting title, and three of those were Joe Maurer in a four year span. Uh, and then you know, when we we're talking about Beltram, I mean, it's crazy because. I think up until he was about 30 or 31, you're like Adrian Beltre, probably not a Hall of Famer. Then he signs that contract with Boston and resurrects his career. And he was so good through his late 30s with Texas that mm-hmm. uh, he went from eh, maybe to, yeah, he's definitely a Hall of Famer. So let's take a look at my personal 10. And I know steroids is definitely a divisive thing, but I'm of the belief that because Bud Selig is in the Hall of Fame, might as well let those guys in. So my 10 are Carlos Beltran, Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, Andrew Jones, Joe Maurer, Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, Gary Sheffield, Billy Wagner, and I'm not going to not vote for my favorite player, David Wright. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and I'll, I'll explain the right thing to you. I alluded to it earlier, but it's about keeping guys on the ballot. Do I necessarily think David Wright will make the Hall of Fame or is a Hall of Famer? No. Unfortunately, the injuries derailed his career. I'm sure we're going to have this conversation when Dustin Pedroia ends up on the ballot. And heck, people are having this debate with Joe Maurer because he had to move to first base for his injury issues. David Wright in his prime was an incredibly exciting player. Uh, I understand I am biased because he was basically my childhood idol. Uh, but I think that he deserves at least some consideration. So those are my 10. Uh, let's not talk through those some of those tough decisions you had to make and splash i i want to hear from you because i noticed that you left joe mauer off your ballot uh why why do you think you left joe mauer off yeah the, <clears throat> this is just a more strategic vote um he's around 80 percent now uh with public ballots and if he doesn't make it in this year he'll be in the like mid 70s so we will make it next year and if given the opportunity i would vote for him next year uh, but this is a case of there's guys that are making climbs that uh, I'm trying to clear, like I'm trying to put Helton in, I'm trying to put Wagner in, I'm trying to get Jones, Sheffield in. Um, and you can throw Maurer into that. I think Maurer's case is a little bit uh, stronger than those guys. And I'm not going to leave Adrian Beltre off, right? Be- Beltre is the, the lock of the group, the mortal lock of the group, uh, trending at 99% right now. Um, but I wanted to get as many guys in the Hall of Hall of Fame this year because next year's ballot, there's a lot of guys I need to vote for, right? Uh, and if I had a vote, of course. Um, so just a, a tough luck met for Maurer that if I could vote for 11 guys, I would vote for him. And then it, it's a drop off. You know, you have uh, sorted by uh, sorted by war. The best player I left off was Andy Pettit. Um, I voted for him in some years in the past. This is just a loaded ballot. You can make arguments for Mark Burley. Uh, Tory Hunter kind of gets screwed here because he's a lesser version of Andrew Jones. So if you have like the A-B testing there of Jones is better at just about everything full time. Well, uh, Hunter didn't fall off a cliff at age 30. I'll give him that. Um, David Wright, maybe in a different year. Um, guys down the ballot, Adrian Gonzalez, maybe in a different year, I'd throw a vote his way. Um, so... Uh, Francisco Rodriguez is a guy I believe I would have voted for last year, um, but just a tough, tough, tough group, tough, tough on the ballot this year. So if I could, I would vote for 11 guys and then I'd have three that I would be OK voting for in a different year. But to me, there's a clear tier difference between the top 11 and then the the next group that I may vote for. And I do want to throw it out that Matt Holiday, uh, the the difference between him and Jimmy Rollins career like accolades is a couple of MVP votes in 2007. So if you just consider, if you consider that, uh, I don't know why Rollins is like going to be around 20% and Holiday's probably off the ballot on his first try. Yeah, I think we're, for me, like some of the hard bits here were that I think that uh, J. Roll deserves it too. I think that his career was very interesting as well as, you know, with Holiday too. Um. Francisco Rodriguez was always one of my favorite pitchers and looking at what he has done over his entire career, it's like very few like relievers get a nickname that sticks so well at, to them. Like even Edwin Diaz, who's one of the best ones in today's game here, hopefully when he comes back healthy uh, in sugar, Diaz is fantastic. 
all that, but you got guys like uh, like Mo for Mariana River or Sandman. When you have a name like K Rod, that is so good. He like, got it as, is... a, as a twenty year old, exactly. When he was a rookie, like, exactly. And he's been that dang good his entire time. Like honestly, he was he was my eleventh. Like he's the guy I would put on if I got the opportunity to put uh, another one on, but other guys like Tory Hunter I think is one of the most exciting outfielders that I've ever seen. I love watching him get to play the outfield. V Mart is another guy that I think is very interesting as well. His career definitely one of the more ones that it's always it's legendary in the way of you love telling stories about things that he's done, but the stats don't always hold up as well. I think. Uh, still very, very, very good though. Andy Pettit again. What more can be said about him? He, all these guys are guys that definitely have what it takes to be a Hall of Fame, but Hall of Famer. But on top of it, right? Like we were talking about this last year, right? Last year's class was not near as strong, and yet, like this year, now it's like you have to make some really hard choices. Last year, we were having trouble trying to uh, fill out a full 10 person ballot the year before that too. And it's not from just adding one or two other guys. It's just that, okay, you know what? We figured out a little bit more about these guys. We've learned a little bit more about why these guys deserve to be here. And it's fun, especially when you do get to add the new talent to that too. That's the thing though, is that, you know, Chase Utley, it's his first year on the ballot. And I feel like if, he was in a different class. Uh, he probably would get my vote here. That's the thing. If he had entered the ballot a year earlier last year, I would have voted for him, I think. But this year, it's it's just so tough. I mean, you have – it's the thing. You have three guys who – I mean, I'm assuming Utley will get into the Hall of Fame eventually as more names go on and off the ballot. That's the thing. Next year, there's – I mean, each of them is probably like a surefire Hall of Famer. You know, it's – it's going to be a, a different class again. I just also want to shout out a couple guys who are probably going to fall off the ballot. Uh, in addition to the guys you mentioned, me, Jose Bautista. Uh, he's, I mean, he was an iconic player for a little bit uh, mm-hmm. with that bat flip and everything. Uh, Brandon Phillips, I feel like that's a dude who always played the game with so much swagger over 2,000 hits. Uh, Jose Reyes, who was one of my personal favorites growing up. I know he had off the field issues later in his career, but, and he was so electrifying for a bit in his prime the first met to win a batting title. Uh, but you, you mentioned, I mean, the tough omissions for me. So K-Rod is one thing. I feel like K-Rod, similar to Andrew Jones, very steep fall off that happened suddenly. He was like an effective closer up until 2016. 2017, he got off to a terrible start and never got picked up again. Uh, if he had stuck around longer, there's a chance he reaches 500 saves, in which case, sure fire Hall of Famer. Uh, but in, in this... You know, Bobby Abreu for me was the toughest guy to leave off, I think, uh, because he's so underrated. He was a great on base machine who could hit for power and had great speed. He could hit for average. I just, I, man, I wanted to include him. But again, this guy in another year, I probably would have given him, I think last year, I would have given him my vote. So he's right on the cutting edge. Mark Burley, legendary workhorse. I would have considered him to. But yeah, that's that's where I stand on this. Uh, any other thoughts before we move on to our next segment? Yeah, uh, this is this is a case. Uh, Bob Nightingale had a tweet that Bobby Abreu doesn't look like a Hall of Famer, and he doesn't have the accolades of a Hall of Famer. And note that Nightingale is a baseball writer, and baseball writers vote on both awards and the Hall of Fame. So you're you're kind of double dipping here that you're you have a selection bias, right? So if you are popular with the writers and you're going to, in general, like if you're going to vote for one guy over the other, you might vote for the guy that you like a little bit more. I don't know if writers do that more, used to do that more than they do now, I believe. Um, You can have some home cooking, I guess, like Brandon Crawford finishing fourth in NL MVP um, two years ago. (laughs) Uh, But this is one issue... I have when you have the voting pool is being the same as the ones giving out awards for these players that Bobby Abreu was underappreciated during his career. And he's going to be underappreciated on the ballot because it's the same group of people voting for him. Now, if you leave Abreu off your ballot, 
that's fine. There's justifiable reasons, right? The the Phillies got better when he wasn't there, and his walks and doubles aren't exactly the most beautiful, picturesque things you can do on a baseball field. And he's definitely a more sabermetric case than other guys. Like if you were if you had a gun to your head and had to pick one Philly since 2000 to put in the Hall of Fame. I think more Philly fans would put in a Jimmy Rollins or a Chase Utley. Um, they would definitely pick uh, Roy Halladay probably, but they would pick a Rollins or an Utley over an Abreu, even if Abreu has a stronger overall case, potentially. That's the thing. It's So if Rollins is also – you. I mean, I didn't realize this for a while, but Rollins is the Phillies' all-time hit leader. All right. Career 95 OPS plus, yes. But like you said, he had the accolades. He won an MVP. Did he deserve that MVP? Uh, I will die on this hill that he was not even the best player on his own team. But he has that accolade. I mean, it goes back also to when Johan Santana was on the ballot. If he had won that 2005 Cy Young, would Johan Santana had gotten into the Hall of Fame for having three Cy Youngs? Or Tim Linscum wins one extra Cy Young. Does he get in? Or We're going to have this conversation, I'm sure, with Jacob deGrom uh, mm-hmm. when his time comes. You know, he has two Cy Youngs right now, but if his career is too short because of the injuries, is he a Hall of Famer? You know, it's 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 so tough, like, whether you value, like, a guy's peak or what he was for his career. You know, Sandy Koufax is in the Hall of Fame because he was an exceptional pitcher, but he mm-hmm. didn't have the longest career. With the uh, At the plate, it's Ralph Kiner. 10 years, 369 home runs. Like, that's ridiculous but he only played 10 years so anyways Mm -hmm. i think that's uh, unless alex you have something to add uh yeah i'll just add like briefly to this that's uh legitimately almost everyone that we have talked about today or are on the ballot deserves to make it they all have amazing credibility to them and they've played incredible careers it's really hard like honestly to be fair who anyone who has not filled out a hall of fame ballot try it try to justify yourself limiting yourself to only 10 names and then once you do that then you'll understand a little bit more of like why angry some people get when you don't put 10 full names or if you leave your ballot god forbid a blank you leave a blank or if you have one name (laughs) yeah if you have one name or you just leave a blank uh you should have your credentials removed yeah uh i I, I don't know if i would go that far but i think every I think every ballot should come with an explanation and should which should come with a Yeah, you should write a column about it every time. Yeah, I, I write a column. I know a lot of people do it. Tweet about it. Like there should be I know Ryan Thibodeau does great work with the ballot tracker. I think there should be a like even if it's a group on Twitter that you have the explanation for all of your picks, right? If you want to leave off Todd Helton because he's a chorus merchant, fine. If you want to leave Andrew Jones off because he has off the field stuff, fine. If you want to leave Adrian Beltre because you like touching people's heads, I I disagree with you, but fine. Right. But I would like some explanations. That's the that's the only thing. Like as a I'll just use Andrew Jones as an example. As a diehard Braves fan, right? How can you not vote for a guy who is at worst the second greatest defensive player? a second second greatest defensive outfielder in the history of the sport and a guy who was an above average hitter, right? A guy who hit 434 home runs, right? We have the number one defensive player at every other position besides left field, but that comes with the Barry Bonds level asterisk. The best defensive player in every other position is in the Hall of Fame. Roberto Clemente is in the Hall of Fame. Brooks Robinson's in the Hall of Fame. Ozzie Smith is in the Hall of Fame. Bill Mazeroski is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, you can make the argument at first base that uh, – Keith Hernandez is not uh, by defensive war. I think it's Roger Connor, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Pat Rodriguez is in the Hall of Fame. I think he's the D war leader, but if he's not, then Yadier Molina is going to be in here in a couple years. So defense gets rewarded at every other position. Why aren't you going to reward Andrew Jones? Yeah, that's yeah, Jones. That's also he. I mean, he had 51 home runs in a season. Uh, so, you know, as, as I, he tormented my Mets when I was younger, but like he was an outstanding player. I'll acknowledge that. But anyways, we're going to move along here. We're going to continue with our positional rankings today. We are moving over to the hot corner. When I was younger, I mentioned David Wright. 
uh, earlier. When I was younger, I wanted to play third base because of David Wright. Uh, I was not a particularly good third baseman. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, uh, let's get going on here. We have our top five third basemen. So, uh, Alex, let's go to you first. Let's you. How about you kick us off with number five in our third base rankings? All right. So first, I'll just because I want to say we're today we're talking about the the hot corner, the hot hot corner. Still one of the oh, best, man. one of the best baseball commercials ever, and I will take no criticism on that. It is absolutely fantastic. Anyway, my number five is one that has won numerous Gold Gloves here, and that is one Nolan Arenado. He just barely made the list here for this like the thing that when you think of Arnado is you think of defense and you know what yeah he's a he's a defender is he the best in baseball absolutely not uh like a lot of baseball people will tell you that he is he is absolutely not but even still with them a good hitter one that helps lead a team at that point and you look at like a lot of the players especially at the hot corner that's what you need good defense at like you could get away with saying you know maybe not having the best fielding you know left fielder or first baseman third base you really need to have a good hand and you know what Arnado does is he the absolute best no put some respect on key brian hayes name but he definitely deserves to be here for the bat that he has as well as being a solid defender he's my number five yeah, I'm going to follow Alex here. I agree with you. Uh, Arenado did have a down year, um, and he's always a guy that has outperformed his batted ball metrics. Uh, last year, he um, actually – take that. Yeah, he's always outperformed his batted ball metrics, um, and last year was no different. But I don't know. It's one of those weird years. I think that I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he was in such a disaster in St. Louis that – that was just a cruddy team. They couldn't pitch. They kept losing games. The sky was falling, you know, the whole season. You know, he, he still had a, a pretty good defensive season. He finally was not named a uh, Gold Glove finalist, if you can believe that. Um, and he didn't win the Gold Glove. And I had been on the Keep Brian Hayes wagon here the last few years, but Arnado is still a great defensive player. Uh, is generally going to be a good hitter. I would expect him to bounce back. Um, he had hit 30 home runs both in 2021 and 2022. Last year, he was down at 26, a 774 OPS. So he should be in the 800s again next year. Um, and it, it's tough with this group of third basemen because you have so many guys in flux that Manny Machado had a down year. Um, you have guys that are ascending like Josh Young and Gunnar Henderson, who I, I would count as a utility player, not a third baseman or shortstop, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and then you have players in the top four that it's all close together. And I think a lot of these guys would be on that A tier of a tier list, right? That I don't think Arenado is miles behind my number two, three, or four. I would have them all in the same tier, but I would take the other three guys just by a hair over Arenado. So in a very tough decision, I actually do not have Nolan Arenado in my top five. Uh, I had him just outside of it. And there are a couple other guys who also, I think, are right on the edge. You know, up, you know, guys on the up and up like Key Brian Hayes and Josh Young. I'm also going with another young guy at my number five. I have Isak Paredes. Uh, he broke out in a big way, 31 home runs. You know, he was over 30% better than league average, which, I mean, he – yeah, yeah, the stat cast page is confusing, but he hits the ball in the air a lot. He pulls the ball a lot, which I think works in a ballpark like Tropicana Field. Uh, I really like the way he plays. Uh, his defense is about average, but hitting in the middle of that lineup for Tampa Bay, he's an impact bat. He does enough to the point where his glove, I mean, if it's average, it's fine. Uh, so Paredes, I have at number five. He's only 24. Uh, it's crazy. He's been in the year for about four years now. You know, it's just, I, I think that he's number five for me right now. Uh, like I said, there's a chance that guy, maybe Arenado has a bounce back year or, or something, or Hayes has a big offensive year, which by the way, if Key Brian Hayes' offense was just a bit better, I would have had him at number five, maybe even number four. 
Uh, I'm really excited to watch P. Brian Hayes in the years down the line, by the way. Uh, so let's move on to number four. Uh, Splash, why don't you go first on this one? Who's your number four third baseman? So my number four is Rafi Devers of the Boston Red Sox. This is this is a tough one. He's another guy that had a bit of a down season last year. Uh, some of his home runs were doubles and some of his doubles were outs. And it was, I don't know, it's sort of, I'm going to say Xander Bogarts at shortstop, right? So former teammates, right? Uh, that Devers is always going to be good offensively, but it. I want to see a great season. I think the top three guys can have great seasons, will have great seasons. I think Devers is a guy that is a tick below that. And you throw in that he's not great defensively. He's not very good defensively. Defensive metrics can be scattered, but he's generally lower um, in the defensive world. Doesn't have much range at third probably better suited to play first base and but he hits, you know, he hits a lot, um, a lot of doubles uh, can walk some. And he might be a guy that's boosted a little bit. The double total boosted a little bit with Fenway, but I think he can hit anywhere. Uh, so I have him at number four. I mean, that's a thing. So I'll put it this way. I don't have Devers on my top five, but I think it's really because the defense confuses me, you know, and like every year I can count on his bat. I feel like I can never count on his glove. You know, for my stratomatic people, he's a four or five every year at third base, just because he cannot, he, like you said, no range over there. Uh, I'll go ahead with my number four, which is uh, Alex Bregman. Uh, I feel like because of the whole, you know, Astros, you know, cheating nonsense, he gets, uh, underrated because everyone wants to hate the Astros. Uh, uh, the The reality is that he walked more than he struck out this year. He had an 804 OPS, which was a 122 OPS plus. All right, down from a 134 the year before, still 4.9 baseball reference war, 25 homers, 98 RBIs, uh, just an all-around good player, uh, solid defense, a little above average. Uh, but really, I like the fact that he – he draws a lot of walks, 12.7% walk rate, only a 12% strikeout rate, only a 13.3% strikeout rate for his career. He's never, in a full season, never struck out more than 16% uh, in a season. So Bregman, I think he's just an all-around solid player who he'll hit for power, he'll get on base, he'll play solid defense. So I have Bregman at number four. Uh, he, I, I, There is also, I think, a solid argument he could be number three. I could also see a reason why he could be number five. So, uh, Alex, who's your number four? My number four, I went digging a little bit on this one here. I'm, I still think that he's legitimately one of the best third baseman out there here, and it's really a lot of it for the bat that he holds, and that is Manny Machado. I think that Machado overall is still one of the best and has shown that he could be both defensively and offensively great. He had a big down year last year, I think. And it kind of showed that, okay, you know what? Maybe he's starting to show a little bit more of that age, but I don't know. Something about what I see from him is that every time that I doubt Manny Machado, he does extremely well. So seeing that he's coming off of a down year and people think that maybe he's not going to be at that level. I think he's going to rise up to it. Now he is he going to be the number one guy. Absolutely not. I, I, don't think there's a chance, especially with who we, I think we may all have at number one here, but right now I still think the Machado, when you look at what the projections have for him this coming year, right now, not the best strikeout rate, but a pretty decent walk rate at 9.2%. Overall, he hits the ball hard. He hits the ball well, and defensively is still getting the job done. So honestly, yeah, for that reason, I have Machado at number four. That's interesting because I'll go ahead and with go with my number three uh, to start. I have Machado at number three. Uh, I don't know. I'm a little bit more of a believer in Machado than Arenado, uh, partially because his glove, he's still in his, the 97th percentile and outs above average uh, with 11. At I mean, in a, in a down year, quote unquote. Uh, and even in this down year, he still hit 30 homers. Uh, yes, his OPS was down to 782. Only 115 OPS plus, but this guy, I mean, I mean, Arenado's probably on the Hall of Fame track too, I would say. But Machado, I mean, you know, he's only 31 right now. 
Uh, you know, e- even like I said, even in his down year, still supplies power. Oh, I should mention also 30 homers in 138 games. That's actually a pretty strong rate. If he plays a full season, he probably has 35 or 40. So he's still got plenty of power, still plays good defense. I think, you know, San Diego, it's going to be tough next year because he, they don't have Juan Soto, but I think Machado can bounce back. He's getting paid that huge contract. So I'm really excited to watch him play this year. Again, he's a guy where I, I, I understand he can be frustrating to watch because he doesn't always hustle and he's, you know, publicly spoken about how he's not Charlie hustle and all that. But I think he's really fun to watch when he's on and he's incredibly talented. And I, I expect big things from him. So I have him at number three. So uh, Sp- Splash, why don't you give us your number three next? Sure. Um, my number three is Alex Spregman. Uh, like I said, with Devers that sometimes the ballpark is the big factor here that, uh, Bregman can pull a ball into the Crawford boxes. Uh, he's probably not going to hit 40 home runs again like he did in his near MVP season, but he's just well, a, a well, juice ball year. That's <laughs> true too, but his, his spray chart was quite something. But he, you know, he's a well-rounded player, offensively, defensively, he can do it all. Um, definitely one of the five-tool sort of players at third base. Um, was a plus defensive player last year, uh, unlike Devers. The the batted ball profile maybe not quite as good as Devers or the guys in my top two, but it it's it's very good. Last year he was sixth in expected woba among third basemen. Um, both number one and number two were higher than him, and a couple guys that aren't quite known for being good with the glove like Jake Berger and Max Muncy. Uh, but Bregman was sixth there, um, a three fifty one woba, three fifty one expected woba, right in line. Just a good hitter, like Max said, he he walks more than he strikes out. And he's a guy that I think is going to be, uh, I believe he's entering a contract year. So I don't think Houston retains him because they're going to work their devil magic and find someone to replace him. But he should be an intriguing option uh, on the free agent market next season. So Alex Bregman, Alex Bregman's my number three. I mean, I feel like Alex, uh, you definitely have Alex Bregman at number one, right? Uh, because I, his I name mean, is Alex, Alex Bregman Alex, just is... like yours, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna have to hit you with the no on that one, there, Chief. Um, but uh, Bregman's not on my list. I very purposely left him off my list. My number three is Ravi Devers. Devers, kind of like for what you're saying earlier, the biggest question mark that you're gonna have with him is that defense. And yeah, I'll, rightfully so. His defense is not good. Fangraphs has uh, his projected defense board negative two point oh, which is. One of the worst, actually, he's not though the number one worst defensive guy uh, by the metrics there. But what he does do, he hits the ball extremely well. According to the projections that I have for Rafi Devers, he has uh, the second highest offensive projected war at a 26.7. Like, come on, the dude mashes. And like, all you really need from him is just a little bit of luck. Because, like we said, he's had some downtimes where those hard hit balls turn a double into a out, or turn what should have been a home run into a single or a double. Like this needs to be the year where he he's going to be figuring out a little bit more. We've seen what happens. It's not even just that. Oh, he's a rookie who has potential. No, we've seen it happen. We have seen this dude be legitimately an MVP candidate. Not just one of the best third base in all of baseball, but because that bat is so strong, you can't help but give it a loss, a good bit of hope. And in a ballpark like Fenway for Devers, it makes a lot more sense of how good he can do. And if he's just a little bit faster, he'd be legging out doubles by just by hitting liners off the monster, basically off of as a at Q. So for that, I have Devers at three. Yeah, like I said, Devers is a guy where if his glove was even adequate, uh, I would probably have him in my top five. But his bat, I'm, I'll never question his bat. That dude has so much pop in it. Uh, homers, doubles, et cetera. He, he does it all. He's an extra base hit machine. But anyways, Alex, let's go back to you for, to start mm-hmm. our number two. So who do you have as your second rank third baseman? So I was talking about def- uh, defense when it came to Machado, to Devers. Well, this is a guy that is, according to baseball reference, the worst defensive third baseman here on my top five here, and that's Austin Riley. 
Austin Riley, yes, is his defense good? Absolutely not. It is negative 5.0 projected, but you know what he is dang good at? Hitting the ball with power. He puts the ball in play with authority that even though he may not have the absolute highest offensive war, when you watch him play third base, when you watch him with a bat in his hands, he is dangerous. He has that clutch ability. He can hit the ball out of the ballpark whenever you like it, basically. I mean, it's fun watching Austin Riley. We had a lot of questions about the guy over the last couple of years about whether or not is he going to be the guy. Guess what? He's the guy now. He is, without a doubt right now, one of the best third basemen with a bat in his hands. Defensively, yes, definitely needs some work. The range isn't there. The reaction time is having some problems. But we've seen him get better. We have seen him get better as he has played more. It's just about getting comfortable and figuring out what works and then relying on those. So with that being said, again, he's my number two guy, and I think he fully deserves it. Splash, I know you're a big Riley guy, uh, as you being a Braves fan. I mean, do you have him at where, where, where is he on your ranking or who's your yeah. number two? I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I have Austin Riley at number two as well. Um, as much as Alex was railing on his defense, Riley was much improved this year. I do have some concerns that Ron Washington's not going to be there anymore, so hopefully the Braves infield magic returns. Uh, because I don't know if Riley like stole something from Ozzy and Olsen, but. Ozzy and Olsen had down years defensively while Riley was a gold glove finalist. Maybe not a deserving one, but he was a reasonable defensive third baseman for once. But the batted, bro- batted ball profile here is just stellar. 89th percentile expected Woba, 90th percentile or better expected slugging, average exit velo, barrel or barrel rate, hard hit rate, 89th percentile. Uh, he strikes out a little bit uh, too much and doesn't walk a ton. But I will say both of those numbers are trending in the right direction. Um, so his 2021 season is big breakout season, World Series winning season. He was over 25% strikeout rate and under 8% walks. Uh, both of those have gone the opposite direction. So 24% K rate last year, over 8% walk rate this year. So if he's more in line with like a 22, 23% strikeout rate and a 9% walk rate, with as hard as he hits the ball, he just finds gaps at Truist Park. Um, he's hit 30 home runs each of the last three seasons. He's had at least 30 doubles each of the last three seasons. He's had 300 total bases each of the last three seasons. He doesn't miss games. He's played uh, at least 100. Uh, let me see. At least 159 games in each of the last three seasons. He's taking 650 plus plate appearances. <clears throat> Just a stud. Last year, he had this knack of not coming through in the clutch for the Braves. Note that he hit behind Ronald Acuna and Matt Olson for chunks of the season and ended up with just 97 RBI, which sounds uh, delusional. And he just couldn't come through uh, in clutch situations. But when the bases were empty, he was practically Barry Bonds. So hopefully there's some uh, regression to the mean there and he'll mash with runners on. and He'll, be, he'll cruise past 100 RBI for the second time in his career. But Austin Riley is my number two. I do so want to be very really yeah. clear. One, one quick thing here. Uh, yes, I was railing on the defense, but I also very much said that it has been improved and he is getting better, better each year. I don't want the smoke. I don't want the smoke. Yeah. yeah it, it's it's weird because it's another case where baseball reference says he's like much, he's like, he's nine defensive runs saved, you know, but you go on to fan graphs and they'll say he's below average. And you go on stat cast, he only has. Uh, the, he is zero now it's above average so he's average you know but man i i have riley at two also i can't stand facing him as a as a mets fan i mean he, 18 home runs against the mets in his career that's more than he has against any other team uh just barely ahead of what he's done against the phillies uh but you know 37 homers this year another great offensive year uh his stat cast page full of red he hits the ball hard he hits the ball in the air consistently yes he strikes out some but when you hit that many home runs you accept the strikeouts so there's not much to say about riley uh that you know not much not not really a lot of negative things to say about him uh like i said i wish he wasn't in the division uh because facing him is scary uh and i mean he just i remember when he first came up he he was a big 
you know, big time power prospect kept swinging and missing. Uh, now he's sort of leveled that out and he still has that power. So yeah, Riley. So we universally all have Riley at number two. It makes me wonder if we all have the same number one too. So Splash, why don't you kick us off? Who's the number one third baseman in baseball? Is it January 2023 again? Because it's the same number one for me, Jose Ramirez. Uh, last year, I talked about the fear factor. Uh, recall that he led <clears throat> he led the American League in intentional walks, not Shohei Otani, not Aaron Judge, not those guys. It was Jose Ramirez. Now, part of that's due to the uh, disaster that is the Cleveland lineup and the lack of power that this team hits for. But Ramirez had another 2020 season last year, 24 home runs, 28 steals. He's very good defensively. Doesn't strike out much, walks at a good rate. Um, he's a guy that, depending on the year, will walk as much as he strikes out. Um, expected batting average of 299. That's insane. Expected Woba a little bit lower than some of the other guys on the list, but he is an all around excellent third baseman. Uh, he's a good base runner, a good hitter, a good fielder. His arm's all right for third. Um, a switch hitter, does damage from both sides of the plate. And he's just really a consistent player and it's tough to be it's tough to be consistent in that lineup when it's so much uh I've I've complained about this before but it's so much of like Cleveland baseball it's you need Quan to get a hit or Straw to get a hit or Jimenez to get a hit and you have to string all these hits together and sometimes Cleveland's rolling and sometimes they're not well one guy that's almost always rolling is Jose Ramirez uh he's at a 10 percent walk rate or better each of the last uh yeah each of the last four seasons and five of the last six seasons, he's just just an excellent all around player. He's still my number one, even in his age thirty one or at age thirty one now. Uh, he's a guy I think that's trending right towards Cooperstown, right with Arenado, right with uh, right with Machado, and hopefully one day right with the likes of Riley Endeavors. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not a lot to dislike about Jose Ramirez. I think. Yeah, like you said, I feel like people don't even realize we're watching a future Hall of Famer uh, before our eyes. And I should mention, he's the same age as Machado. Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, because he came up later, uh, or uh, he actually only came up a year after Machado. But that's the other thing. People don't realize how long he's been in the league. Uh, and he didn't really break out until 2016. But, I mean, like you said, consistency. He He's a guy who I feel like you can ask for 20 homers, 20 steals every single year good walk rate, not a lot of strikeouts. He can hit for power. I mean, for a little guy, he's only 5'9", but he's got some serious pop in his swing. Plus, he runs well. Uh, yeah, so J-Ram is my number one. He was right on the cusp for me last year. I feel like he's just so underrated. Maybe it's because he plays in Cleveland, which isn't the largest market, but, I mean, he's the, easily the best player in their lineup. They kept him when they traded Lindor and Carrasco and Kluber. You know, they, they were just dishing off pieces, but they held on to J-Ram. They gave him an extension, and Cleveland has their face of the franchise for the next probably five or six years. I know he's on an eight-year contract, really team-friendly deal. Uh, so Cleveland's really lucky to have this guy. He can also play a bit of second and short, but it's just awesome to watch him play. He's really fun to watch. Uh, he also dealt a nasty knockout punch to Tim Anderson this year. That was Oof. Now that you know. Was, don't yeah, don't mess with Jose Ramirez. By the way, that's uh, why they so. signed. That's why they signed them to that extension. It's not just because he can play baseball. He's also going to go make money for Cleveland as a boxer. So exactly. That makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, J J Ram is my number one. Alex, I'm assuming your number one is uh, who? Who's your number one? I wonder. Yeah. So my number one is uh, Luis Urias. Bottom. Text. Oh, okay. Yeah. And. Uh, no, uh, obviously it's J Ram. I mean, it's kind of weird to think about this, but J Ram's underrated as the number one. Like, I think he's starting to get almost okay. So, again, yeah, bear with me for just a moment. I'm not like this is just this is a complete thought. J Ram is starting to get what I like to call like the Mike Trout effect, which is that he's been so good for so long that people forget that he's good. Like, people will just kind of forget that and just kind of take him for granted that when he is doing these amazing things, when he is, you know, being the best third baseman in baseball, we just kind of take it for granted. You kind of take Trout for granted half the time. And now that he's, you know, at the near the end of his career, 
you're like, oh, dang, I wish I got to watch this future Hall of Famer play more. We have that right now with J-Ram. J-Ram is legitimately one of the best players in all of baseball. A great hitter, a great defender, and a switch hitter. Even at that. Like, what more do you want out of a guy? He is a great face of the franchise. He's really good for the fans there, too. I mean, J-Ram is by far... In my opinion right now, I want to say by far number one. Like, Austin Riley is great. Don't get me wrong. Austin Riley's great. Devers is great. I feel like one through seven, honestly, can be pretty well interchangeable. But number one is J-Ram. It's just J-Ram. He's that. And I, appreciate, and I appreciate the fact that he's a switch hitter who uh, doesn't really have a weak side. Exactly, uh, like yeah. Said. Yeah, because, I mean, I feel like every, every switch hitter has, like, their power side or their – you know, their average side, but for him, mm-hmm. it's kind of, you know, he, he can do either. Uh, anyways, uh, that, that does it for our rankings. Let us know at LAR underscore baseball. If you think we, we got something wrong, you know, you can tell us, tell us we're wrong, you know, uh, drop us a line over there. You can maybe give us your rankings, but anyways, it's time for everyone's favorite segment every week. It's time for trivia. And I will hand it over to Splash for this week's segment. So take it away. Oh, yeah. It's time for trivia, boys and girls. Today, the name of the game is Third Baseman. And today, we're going to play a little game called Third, T-H-I-R-D. The first one to accumulate three letters out of third, or uh, that's not accurate. Uh, I have nine players here. Their names Either their first name or their last name corresponds with each letter in third. So we have two players for T, two players for H, two players for R, and three players for D because there was a tie. So nine players total. You have to tell me the player with the highest war among third basemen for each letter. So you get a first name, you get a last name with that letter. So example, Chipper Jones doesn't count because none of his initials are T, H, I, R, or D. Okay, so are we going first or last initial? Both. Both. Well, so both not, have to be in T H I R D. No, no. Oh, either one has to be. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can be the oh, number one okay. among R's. You can be the number one among D's. Um, one player oh. was the number one among one of them, and then number two among the other. So I have them listed for one, not the other. Uh, so yeah, that the name of the game. You get the number one player among players that have that initial, either first or last. So, who would like okay. to go first? Um, I'll go first. All right. Go ahead. Then, um, for third base, I'm gonna go for R. Here, I'm gonna go for Brooks Robinson. Last initial. That is correct. Alex leads one nothing. So wait, you have to be in the top of what for the? You have again? to be. You have to be the leader among third basemen in WAR for your oh, that initial, okay. either first or last. Uh, hmm. So Brooks Robinson is the last initial for an R. Their, yeah. The first initial is still available. Okay. Whew. This is difficult. I'll tell you that much. Um, if we had more time, there are a lot of them with Bs. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a lot of Bs. Beltre, Boggs, Brett, Bell, Boyer, right? Uh, mm-hmm. If we had done third base... They would have been all the B answers, potentially. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to take a shot here. Uh, third base. I'm also going with uh, R, but for first name, this might be tough, but I'm going to go with Ron Santo. Ron Santo is correct. It is Let's tied. Go. All right. Alex, R is off the board. You have two T's, two H's, and three D's. There were no I's. There were no eyes that I could yeah, find. Tough, yeah. Uh, the only eye that I can think of is Ichiro, and obviously he's not a third base. Yeah, baseman. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. That is actually really tough. And then Ian. K- oh, I guess Brandon Inge. He's way down there. Um, Ian Kinsler played second. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's see here. Because I'm like, I'm going through my head of like famous third basemen, the ones I would play with, like, and it will be the show. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to go. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, this was a really good category, oh, yeah, to be honest with you. So, Jeez. yeah, 
The eyes, if we were to do eyes, the answers would be Isak Paredes and Brandon Inge. Yeah. Damn, that, um, that... <laughs> I'm getting real. I'm not coming up with like really any names here. Uh, I will say all of them have at least 35 baseball reference war. So this isn't like, okay. Yeah. We're not scraping the bottom of the barrel here. I figured as much. Um, Wow, yeah, I've got I've got like nothing. Like I got my first one easy. Like that, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Because Brooks Robinson is actually fair, one of my favorites of all time just because I had the same nickname as him when mm-hmm. I played. The human vacuum. There you go. Um okay, I'm just gonna throw out a name that I like as well. Uh oh no, we already used R both first and last, right? Yes. Yeah. Dang yeah. it. Because I thought Ryan Zimmerman. Good um, call. Yeah, Would not have been a that. correct answer, yeah. but good call. Yeah. Um Crap. Yeah, I got I really got nothing. Uh hmm. great podcasting here, by the way. Yeah, no, I'm like, this is like <laughs> really tough. Like, I can't even think of anybody. Like, normally I would just like throw like a out a random name, but I legitimately cannot think of anybody. Um, can I just pass? Like I, yeah, sure. I guess I'll I'll take the L here, but I'm like I legitimately cannot think of one. Okay, Mac, Mac back to you. Uh, Mac, can you? I I'm I'm doing my thinking right now. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna take a stab at D. I don't think this is right, but uh, David Wright for D. Uh, David Wright is third among. D's. Oh man. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I think I I'm gonna be real with you, Chief. I think you picked an impossible category, my friend. Wait, uh, hold up. Are we talking guys in like the modern era or some of these like like? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Um, the all of these guys played in the live ball era, except for one. But that guy is a Hall of Famer. What in the world? So. Yeah, he, he, Robinson's a Hall of Famer. Santos a Hall of Famer. Then this guy's a uh, like dead ball okay. early live ball era Hall All of right. Famer. I've got I've got one name. Then um, uh, integration, integration, a pre integration, integration, active, and active. Just because I've been learning about this guy a little bit more for H. Hank Thompson. Uh that is a negative, sir. Okay. Wait, you said they're two active players. Yes, two active players. Wow. An active how, player that works for this. How am I whiffing on this? It's my Yeah, question. I'm whiffing on this too, mate. Um like, an a- okay, active players. Um T T so we have T H and D left, right? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So two active players, Hall of Famer, and a bunch of guys that played in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. <laughs> 60s, 70s, and 80s. The golden age of third baseman, besides right now, probably. Yeah, I realized. Uh, hmm. Do, doing the, the thinking thing right now. Yeah, the thinking uh, thing is not done well for me, Ben. <laughs> I'm trying to say trying David to think, Wright was a very good guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of the, the active people. Like, you know, it's. I, I mean, unless I'm. I, I must be misfiring really badly right now. Um, hmm. Because n- it clearly isn't anyone who were on Had a couple the... MVP winners. A couple MVP winners. Um, um, really? Yes. This is a really cool idea for trivia, <laughs> but I think this one might have gone a little too hard. Uh <laughs> Tough. Uh, can, can you uh, help us out at least? Uh, what? What? <laughs> this might be cheating a little bit, but like, uh, are are the guys who are active? Are they in their primes right now or something? No, or are they <clears throat> they are. Uh, one. Uh, one played. I think played sparingly last year on a. I believe on a new team. Yeah, I believe on a new team. The other was not a third baseman last year, uh, but he was on a new team. He's currently a free agent. The other one, I think, is a free agent. I'm not oh. 100% sure there. Oh, wait. No. no don't, damn it. It still doesn't make sense. Never mind. Yeah, well, one is 100% agent. a third baseman. He has been linked 
with several teams. The other, okay, both of them are both of them are free agents. One of them is linked with teams because they're interested in his services. Uh, the other is not linked with anyone at the moment because they're not interested in this guy's 0. .2 baseball reference war from last season. 0. .2 baseball reference war. Oh, yeah, he did play for a new team. Ew, these stats are stinky last season. But, hey, a couple of years ago, he was uh, 11th in MV- MVP voting. Uh, Wow. Oh, wait, hold up. I have an answer here. Oh, boy. Yes. Uh, Josh Donaldson. That is correct. Let's the go. Bear of rain. Nice. That is one, <laughs> one answer. Uh, Alex, are you going to concede here, or would we like to? I'm. Yeah, no, I'm... I'm... I'm going to uh, give an answer here uh, for uh, T, Kyle Seeger, <laughs> KST. Uh, he technically would have been the correct answer for over this player for T by 0. 0.4 war, but um, obviously his name doesn't Wait, the fit. guy, the guy for T is active or? Yes, the guy for T is active. He is the one with some interest from teams, but not to play third base unless it's with the Mets, I guess. What but... position would he be to Play that. Uh, first base DH type. I guess he he can still play third, but he'd probably be your DH. Wait, what? I oh, former God. Met, by the way. Former Met. I okay. Uh, I wait yeah, a second. Like... I <laughs> the former oh, Met yeah. thing gave it away. So can I just say my answer? Yeah, go ahead. It's Justin Turner. It is Justin yes. Turner. Wait, seriously? Only Justin Turner? Wait. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I thought about Turner, but I'm like, wait, T isn't in third anywhere. Oh my god, I can't believe that. I oh didn't my even god. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. I, don't think, I don't think of him as like a war accumulator. That's the thing. Yeah, he was a darn he was a good yeah. player. He, he okay, player. yeah, he was, but man. All right, well, Splash, I mean, I appreciate that segment. It was incredibly yeah. difficult, but it's a okay. great idea. Uh, uh, here, here's the last five. Uh, yeah. Home Run Baker, he's the Hall of Famer. Oh, okay, yeah, Home Run Baker. Uh, yes. Daryl Evans, Dick Allen, they were tied. Uh, oh, Dick wow. Allen was an MVP award winner. Stan yeah. Hack. Stan Hack, I would not have gotten that. Pre-integration, uh, mm-hmm. post, or live ball era, but pre-integration. Then Toby Hera. Wow, Toby just Harris, a, a name wow. I have not heard in a while. Yeah, uh, just over fifty percent, uh, just over fifty WAR, beating out uh, Bob people, Elliott, David Wright. People so, yeah, forget that Toby Harris was really good. Uh, that's a thing. People forget a lot of these guys were really good. There's a lot of good third basemen. He's the on base machine for the Senators and Rangers. But anyways, thank you, Splash. Uh, I'll take my victory there. By the way, um, good job, boys. Good as you should. Anyways, uh, we're going to wrap up the show with the way we wrap up every show, which is with the moment to ourselves, 60 minutes to sit, 60 minutes, wow, uh, 60 seconds to uh, talk about whatever is on your mind, baseball or not baseball, or sports or not sports. So, gentlemen, which one of you wants to go first? Alex, you can go right ahead. Uh, I saw his hand first. Uh, so your time starts in three, two, one, go. So over the last week, I've gotten to spend uh, – a full week of time with some of my best friends. And it's the first time I've actually gotten to see them in about two years. They live over in California. I'm over here in Seattle. And it was just like, you know what? It's been too long. We need to see each other again. And we did. It was me, my best friend, uh, my best friends and his wife that are here. And then two from California that came down. And we had one of the greatest weeks that I've ever had. It was an amazing time. Just everyone having fun, playing games, and just being around people that we care about. And we're trying to make it a thing going forward that we try to do this at least once a year, if we can. And I, like, if people have, if you have a friend out there, if you have friends that, like, you hold dear, whether or not they be close or far, make it a point to try and go and see them. Make it a point to give and show them the time and show them how much they matter to you guys. So, again, I fully, like, love the fact that I got to do this and... I'm so looking forward to what happens again later. All right, awesome. And I'm glad to hear you had a, a good time because that is something I definitely value. Uh, but uh, Splash, you seemed eager to go next. So you want to go? Mm-hmm. All yeah, right, your time absolutely. starts in three, two, one. Uh, I'm just, just had one of the best weekends of my life, probably number two um, behind when I was national champion. Um, but just a special... 
special time, like being around the Ravens fans uh, in Baltimore, um, just watching Lamar escape his playoff struggles, watching the defense escape their playoff struggles, watching them bounce back from adversity. That was so cool. And then Sunday I went to a Lions bar in D.C. with my uh, my aunt and my cousin. They're both big Lions fans. So that was cool to see them um, experience like – a Lions, another Lions playoff win. They're going to the NFC title game for the first time since 1991. The city of Baltimore is hosting its first AFC title game since 1971. The Ravens are hosting their first as a franchise. So uh, hopefully the next time we talk to you, we will be potentially previewing a Ravens-Lions Super Bowl. Um, so go Ravens. Uh, yeah, I was actually, so I was uh, out with my family in New Jersey when uh, the Ravens uh, Ravens Texans game was on. It was still a close game uh, when we left the restaurant. Uh, it was not very close for very long. But anyways, I'll start my time in three, two, one. So uh, I got to spend a lot of time with my roommates this, uh, this past week, which I think was awesome. Uh, you know, it was just good to hang out with them. I finally had time uh, once I was no longer sick, uh, which, is, which was good. Uh, but one thing we did was go to Trader Joe's on Sunday, and I'd like to shout out uh, my one roommate for uh, showing me the microwaved pasta they have, the frozen pasta. And let me tell you, if you do, have not discovered the frozen pasta at Trader Joe's, please do yourself a favor. Go get yourself a freezer bag of one of those and make it for dinner because this thing, it was life-changing, I'm telling you. Uh, you heat it up, you know, the, the Alfredo sauce and all that. And uh, you maybe you add some mozzarella on it. Or for me, I threw some old meat sauce on it. And that might be the best pasta uh, I've ever had. All right, that's a stretch. But like, that was amazing. It's cheap. They're easy to make. It's easy dinner, easy lunch. So if you have a Trader Joe's near you, go get yourself a bag of that. So that's my moment to uh, myself. Like I said, if you live near Trader Joe's, that stuff is cheap and good. So go get that. Uh, but anyways, that's going to do it for our show today. Uh, make sure to leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to us. Uh, and of course, like I said, follow us on Twitter at LAR underscore baseball. You'll see all sorts of fun tweets about that from all of us. Splash does a lot of it. Uh, but we all we all sort of contribute over there. Uh, make sure to follow our individual accounts to uh, Splash at Mr. Splashman 19, Alex at the Sports Guy 242, and myself at Matthias underscore A underscore K. But for all of us at Losses Blow Replacement, thank you all for listening. Stay safe. I hope to see you all real soon. Take care. <laughs>